Uh, let's go back to Atlanta. Carlos, welcome to the line of fire. Thanks for taking my call and talking to me again. You bet. Uh, first, I want to thank you for speaking out against the leading cause of death in this country, abortion. This is a subject, as you well know, many pastor teachers continue to be silent on. So I want to commend you on that. Well, th- thank you, sir. And I assume that you speak at, at that as well. So thank you for your stand. No, thank you. Okay, uh, just quickly, I want to echo the sentiments of all the other BUs, biblical Unitarians out there. And uh, thank you for allowing this platform because uh, we're sort of, you know, trying to sneak uh, our head in the door, as they say. So quickly, just a couple of comments, and then I'll get to my question. In First Chronicles 29, the, uh, Solomon actually sits on the throne of Yahweh and is worshipped alongside Yahweh. Same in Daniel 7, the saints of the Most High God are worshipped alongside the Ancient of Days. In Revelation 3, Christians are said to sit on the throne with the Father and the Son. And in that same chapter, in verse 9, they are all worshipped. My question is, related to worship, if one has to be God to be worshipped and prayed to, how do you understand Isaiah 45, 14? where the nations, in the, obviously in the future, will both not just worship, but also pray to Israel. And you can check the uh, Hebrew on that and also the Greek. Thank you. First, thank you for your gracious spirit and your humility in presenting things. Much appreciated. Thank you for your questions that are very fair questions and that are thoughtful questions. So much appreciated on all those points. And again, Yes, I'm giving, quote, biblical Unitarians, but I don't believe you're biblical, right? Uh, giving you a platform, but my goal is to expose error. My goal is not to get people to consider your viewpoint, but to allow you to challenge me in, in the presence of my hearers. And my goal is to expose the error and to call you to recognize the glorious eternal son who, with his father, created the universe. Remember Isaiah 44 says that when he created, there was no one with him. He created by himself. And yet the New Testament explicitly on several occasions says that he created with and through his son, who was before all things and through whom all things hold together. Okay, so a a few things. Daniel 7, the end of the chapter, I do not believe that uh, Palach in Aramaic, that that refers to the word for worship there, refers to the saints. I believe it is saying that it goes back to him, namely the Son of Man, to whom all dominion and authority is given. That's the first thing. Second thing, yes, the throne of Yahweh can mean the throne that he gives. So we have to rightly understand that in context. But for sure, there are verbs like avad, to serve, that can be used both for the the king and God. Pishtach avad, to do obeisance to, that can be used for both the king and God even an earthly king, absolutely. And when people bow down and worship Jesus in the Gospels, it does not necessarily mean that they worshiped him as God, just that they did obeisance to him. Look, I've been in India and had Hindus fall at my feet and and kiss my feet because they think I'm a holy man because I just spoke at some rally. It's the most offensive thing to see. You know, it's heartbreaking to see them do that. But yes, in a biblical context, you could do it. You could bow down before a king and it didn't mean you were worshiping him as God. So there is no question whatsoever that there is certain worship, certain adoration that can be given to someone less than eternal God. But there is a particular type of worship adoration that belongs to him alone because he will give his glory to no other, nor can anyone else be worshiped as God. That's the key thing. So when the New Testament presents Jesus as the co-creator, when Hebrews 1, explicitly speaking of the past in the Hebrew, in the Greek, okay, the Hebrew Psalm 102 in the Greek, Septuagint, and then quoted in, in, in Hebrews 1, when it speaks of him in the beginning of old, creating the heavens and the earth, it's talking about the earthly creation, not some alleged new future creation. And that creation will wear out, which this physical earthly creation, it will wear out. But as for the sun, his years endure. And when he's called God, and all the angels are called to worship him as God, Ah, then, then there's no possibility. Either he is eternal deity, or we're guilty of polytheism or idolatry or something else like that. So as far as Israel 
and the nations bowing down before Israel and supplicating Israel. So the same way you can pray to, in Hebrew, you could supplicate, right? So I can supplicate God, I can supplicate individuals. So excellent parallel to point out, Carlos, but again, do you supplicate Israel as you supplicate God? For example, John 14, where Jesus says, pray to the Father, but then he says, if you ask me anything, I'll do it. That's only what God can do. Or, or Stephen saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. That's a divine act. A, a human being can't do that. So it's the nature of the prayer. It's the nature of the worship. I'm really disappointed that the first caller refused to see that at the end of Revelation 5, the identical worship goes up to God, all praise, honor, glory, dominion, power, to, to God and to the Lamb. Unless the Lamb is eternal deity, that's, that's blasphemous. And remember John 8, 58, when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, not I was or, or I've always existed in the mind of God, but before Abraham was, I am, they pick up stones to stone him. Why the offense? 